why we are going to focus on this particular topic is because it is a very difficult situation to manage a child or an adult with diabetes mellitus. Hence, we're going to look basically into the crux of what are the different types of diabetes mellitus which are present or affect the child or the adolescent age group. And that way we're going to have a small look into the management aspects of these types of diabetes mellitus. Now, before we start, we'll go in for the case scenario. We're going to project to you three case scenarios. And at the end of this module, I'm very sure that all of you will be able to come to a correct diagnosis at what each case scenario pertains to. In case one, we have Mr. X, age 16 years, who presents with a history of acute weight loss, polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia for 15 days duration. He had consulted a doctor who told him that his blood sugars were high and he needed to be started on insulin. But the patient was refusing and hence he had come to us for a second opinion. On evaluation here, his fasting blood sugar was 240 and his PC was 450 milligram per deciliter and his ketones were positive. He had a low BMI of 18.1. He does not give history of any abdominal pain or steatoria. He does not give any family history of diabetes mellitus as such. And he has no markers of insulin resistance. What would be the most probable diagnosis? This is a case scenario one. Now we go to the case scenario two. Here we have a 19-year-old male, son of a wealthy executive with a BMI of 28.4. Absolutely he's in the overweight side. He has acanthosis nigricans is present. Patient has gone for a dental extraction because he used to consume a lot of sweets and there just before the extraction the doctor has taken his AC and PC and found that it was in the diabetic range. His AC was 140 and his PC of 270. Late evaluation he was found to have an HbA1c of 8% and he had a strong family history of diabetes mellitus. With these clinical features what would be your most probable diagnosis? This is case scenario 2. Now we go to the case scenario 3. In this, we have a 20-year-old male. He's come for a routine evaluation in view of a strong family history of diabetes mellitus for three generations. And he has a normal BMI. He does not have any markers of insulin resistance. And he has no symptoms of pancreatic diabetes. He comes with a fasting blood sugar of 147 and a postprandial blood sugar of 231. Now what most probably would be a diagnosis? At the end of this module, we'll come back to this and then we'll discuss about the answers. Now, let's go right into the module. As you all know, diabetes mellitus is a chronic metabolic disorder wherein it is characterized by chronic hyperglycemia and there is protein, carbohydrate, and fat metabolism changes. Now, if we say that children are affected by diabetes, most of us do tend to think that there's only type 1 diabetes mellitus and only insulin is the therapy of choice. Yes, type 1 diabetes mellitus do affect a large number of children, maybe comprises maybe 90% of the total diabetes mellitus in children. But it is not the only diabetes mellitus which is found in children or in the adolescent age group. As you can see over here, there are two classifications, or rather two sides of it. One, we have what is known as the transient neonatal diabetes mellitus. On the other side, we have type 1 diabetes mellitus. The person could have type 2 diabetes mellitus. The person could have a maturity onset diabetes in the young. He could have mitochondrial diabetes mellitus. You could suffer from lipoatrophic diabetes mellitus. The patient can have diabetes mellitus due to chronic pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis associated with diabetes mellitus. You can have DIT mode, also the Wolfram syndrome as it's called and terminal diabetes mellitus and neonatal onset. So these are some of the diabetes mellitus which we can find or which we can come across in the childhoods as well as the adolescent age group. Now facts are, little facts about the type 1 diabetes mellitus. As we all know, it comprises 90% of all childhood diabetes mellitus. It has a high incidence in the sense that in the 10 to 14 year old age group, we do find most of the patients are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And the age group of 0 to 5 basically is the age group in which they have a very low incidence of being found out as having type 1 diabetes mellitus. It affects boys in the age group of 12 to 14 years and girls usually it is stated that it is affected in the 10 to 12 years group commonly. Type 1 diabetes mellitus as you all know results from the destruction of beta cells and because of the destruction of beta cells the insulin is not produced. Viruses 
foods and toxins do play a major role in basically triggering off the autoimmune response, which later can cause the patient to have a type 1 diabetes mellitus. Autoimmunity markers like glutamic acid decarboxylase, IAA, ICA, and of course the IA2 are markers which can be basically found out in a patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Most of the times these markers can be made out, but there are times at which also, even though the child has the type 1 diabetes mellitus, we will not be able to find out these autoimmune markers. A C-peptide level is always done, and usually it is low in a patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Now, type 1 diabetes mellitus has a predisposition or a susceptibility to the HLA class 2 genes, and the concordance rate for twins, that is identical twins, is only around 50%. And the classical presenting features of a type 1 diabetes mellitus are the patient will come with polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, and with weight loss. Now, we can say as far as the types of, or rather, the phases of diabetes mellitus, type 1, of course, you can further classify or make it sub, you can subclassify into four basic issues. The first issue is basically a stage of onset. The patient will present with increased weight loss, increased urination, increased appetite, and increased thirst. This is followed by what is known as the honeymoon period. A honeymoon period is nothing but when you initiate a person who is a type 1 diabetes mellitus with insulin, what happens is there is a vestigial beta cells regains its function and at times you will be in a position to decrease the amount of insulin which is given or at times maybe even stop the insulin for a period of time. Now we should not be apprehensive, neither the patient. It is only a transient phase because this phase can last even for even a one year but later what happens is there's intensification. During the intensification phase what really does happen is there is continued beta cell destruction and then this leads on to the phase of total diabetes mellitus where there's total destruction of the beta cells and the person will have to be initiated again on insulin. So it is always important to remember and to advise the parents and the child about this phase called the honeymoon phase in type 1 diabetes mellitus. Now what is this transient neonatal diabetes mellitus? Transient neonatal diabetes mellitus is a condition which lasts for basically four to six weeks and is very sensitive to insulin. Thereby, it disappears. What is permanent diabetes mellitus of neonatal onset? Now, the permanent diabetes mellitus neonatal onset is a familial form. Ketosis is absent. There is no genetic or immunological markers as it is seen in type 1 diabetes mellitus. And apart from this, you should also know that this also is an insulin requiring diabetes mellitus and is associated commonly with what is known as the walcott rallison syndrome. Now, the walcott rallison syndrome is an autosomal recessive condition where you have osteopenia and renal and hepatic dysfunction and mental retardation. So this is another type of diabetes mellitus which can be seen in children. Now, type 2 diabetes mellitus. Type 2 diabetes mellitus, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, was a notion that it can occur only in people who are more than 40 years of age, who are on the overweight or obese side, and the people who have increased caloric intake and less expenditure. This was the thought more than 40 years ago. But in the late 1970s, it was found out that type 2 diabetes mellitus affects children. And the real reason or the main reason is still the same. There's increased energy intake and decreased energy expenditure. And most children who are detected to have type 2 diabetes mellitus in a young age are found to be either overweight and obese and have a very strong family history for diabetes mellitus. Now, as far as statistics shows, in the year 1979, when the Pima Indians were surveyed, they had surveyed them because these are the group of people who have the highest propensity for type 2 diabetes mellitus in the world. Now, when the survey was done in 1979, it was found out that in the age group of 5 to 14 years, the prevalence was 1 in 1,000. And in the age group of 15 to 24 years, the prevalence was 9 in 1,000. 17 years down the line, 1996, the same Pima Indians were again surveyed. And now there was a whopping difference. In the age group of 10 to 14 years, it was 22.3 for 1,000. And the age group of 15 to 19 years, it was 50.9 in 1,000. This goes on to show that there is a rampant increase in type 2 diabetes mellitus in children, and this is mainly due to the change in lifestyle and the eating habits, and moreover, which is 
associated with a sedentary lifestyle. The Cincinnati study in the USA, where they basically studied people in the 10 to 19 age group from 1982 to 1995, when the final report was published, they said that one third of all the diabetics in this age group of 10 to 19 were type 2 diabetes mellitus. This also goes on to show that there is a rampant increase in type 2 diabetes mellitus in children and during the adolescent period. Now, what are the risk factors for type 2 diabetes mellitus in children? One, the most important risk factor is the child will have a very strong family history of type 2 diabetes mellitus, either in the first degree or second degree relative. The child will be overweight, at least a BMI of 27 kg per meter square, or more than 120 percent of an ideal body weight, or the child would have a weight for height of more than 85th percentile. These could be some of the features which would be a marker for a person to identify a person with a type 2 diabetes mellitus. The child usually the screening is done commonly when it's more than 10 years of age. And ethnicity also does play a major role in detecting type 2 diabetes mellitus. It has been found that children of the ethnic group of Asians, Hispanics, people who are American Indian descent and African Americans have a higher propensity to develop type 2 diabetes mellitus. And we have to always look out for markers of insulin resistance like acanthosis, nigricans, and skin tags in all these people, which shows us that these are the people who are more prone and need to be screened for type 2 diabetes mellitus, though they are very young. Hypertension, associated polycystic ovarian syndrome, and hyperlipidemia also have to be evaluated and taken care of simultaneously. And as far as your, what is the test you would like to do, a fasting plasma glucose is very reliable and has to be done. And if the child, he or she is found to have a normal glucose range, maybe a couple of years down the line, the test has to be repeated. Metformin has been approved by the FDA to be used in the treatment of diabetes mellitus, especially if the child is more than 12 years of age. And this would be the first drug which anybody would like to start on in a patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus. So it comes to the next type of diabetes mellitus, maturity onset diabetes in the young. And this constitutes about 1 to 3 percent of the total diabetic population. As the name suggests, it is seen in young people from 10 to 30 years of age. And commonly, we can see most of the people identified within the 20 to 25 years old age group. It's monogenic, and the patient will have a strong family history of at least three generations of people being diabetics and diabetics. And there's a defect in insulin secretion. Now, Modi, at the time of this presentation, there have been eight types of Modi have been identified. The commonest is MODI 3, which is caused by the HNF1 alpha. And we have the glucokinase gene, which, is the, which causes MODI 2. And this is a type of MODI which can be seen as early as 2 to 3 years of life. And this is classically demonstrated by a fasting hypoglycemia, and a good diet and exercise control can basically take care of it. Though a lot of genetic testing and genetics has been talked about in the recent past, about type 1 and type 2 and Modi and everything. Now, genetic examination or genetic estimation of a Modi will basically aid us in telling what kind of treatment has to be given. For example, if it is Modi 2, the person does not need to be put on a sulfonylurea. He just has to be put on only a diet and exercise regimen. If it's a Modi 1, 3, or 5 type, the patient will respond very well to a sulfonylurea. So basically, the genetic testing at this particular juncture is of great use in a maturity onset diabetes of the young. And it has an antibody negative status. If you want to say whether it's a type 1 or not, well, from the history, we have a very strong family history. And the autoantibodies will be negative in this particular kind of diabetes mellitus. Now, the other diabetes mellitus we're not going to touch upon much. But you should also know that we have the lipoatrophic diabetes mellitus in which you have hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, the loss of subcutaneous tissue is there. And though the insulin is there, basically the sensitivity is not there. And this is called the lipoatrophic type of diabetes mellitus. Cystic fibrosis associated type of diabetes mellitus. This is seen in 5 to 15 percent of all patients with cystic fibrosis. And there's always a worsening of the pulmonary function in this particular kind of patients. The mitochondrial diabetes mellitus is due to mutations in the mitochondrial gene which causes a diabetes mellitus in the young. So all these are diabetes mellitus, which can be detected in the children in the adolescent age group 
but are quite rare. But we do come to see these kind of conditions occasionally in our practice. Now, as far as the treatment or the approach or the practical aspects of a treatment of a child or an adolescent with diabetes goes, it is absolutely a team approach. And without a team approach, the final outcome is bound to fail. So what do I mean by a team approach? The most important person in the team is, of course, the patient or the child. And followed by the parents and the siblings, the physician, the nurse, the diabetic educator, the physiotherapist, the dietitian, the social worker, the psychologist, and more importantly, in a children, in a child, the teacher and the school nurse. Now, each and every one of these people have to have a basic idea of the disease and will have to be trained in managing acute complications. And only then will they be able to work as a team and give a better quality of life to the child. So this is always remember the treatment of diabetes mellitus in a child is first and foremost a team approach and not an individual therapy at all. So what are the important factors? The most important factor in the treatment of diabetes mellitus is going to be the parental involvement. Because most of the times the parents will deny that the child has such a disease and that is a phase which has to be taken care of. In the initial phase, it could last even up to six months for the patient to come to terms that his or her child is suffering from diabetes mellitus. Then, of course, you have to conduct summer camps for children with diabetes mellitus. Why is this important? Because this has to be there always. It has to be an infusion or reinfusion of ideas. You have to always keep telling the child and the parents and the siblings about the disease so that they do come to know about the gravity of the situation and will help the child in such a way that he is able to maintain a proper glycemic control, a proper HbA1c, and thereby in the long term prevent complications. Transfer of responsibilities from parents to children during adolescence is a very important factor. The reason being, during adolescence, the child becomes, there's a lot of change in behavior, the child wants to become independent, and he or she comes to the say that, I know how to take, I have been a diabetic for so many years, I know how to take my insulin. But it has been found, and studies have shown, that if a child is constantly kept in supervision, even though he or she is in the adolescent phase, the outcome has always been much better. Prevention of acute and chronic complications is one of the things that the patient, the siblings, and the parents, everyone have to be briefed about from the first time the child is diagnosed as having diabetes mellitus. And always there should be reinforcement of these factors so that they could take care as far as the diet and the medications are concerned with the proper lifestyle, prevent the microvascular complications and later the macrovascular complications, if any. Then we have the normal growth and development. As far as a child is concerned, we have to maintain the normal glucose homeostasis as far as possible so that the growth and development of the child is not affected. This is one of the primary concerns in the treatment of a child with diabetes mellitus. Review of new technology when they meet in the doctor's clinic or as basically in camps, they should be told about the latest advances, the latest treatment modalities which usually come into the market. And psychological support is of utmost importance. We should remember that not only during the initial phase of denial, but during the later stages also, there are stages in which the patient or the parents or the siblings will require psychological support to carry on with the treatment method for the, of their particular ward. What are the goals of therapy? A child with diabetes mellitus, what are we aiming for? One, the most important issue that the parent or child or sibling or the teacher or anybody addresses when he or she comes in contact with the personal physician is hypoglycemia. It is a very frightening and harrowing experience. And once a child has a hypoglycemia, it is more than the child, the parents are very apprehensive. So constantly, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia management has to be told in great detail time after time to the children as well as the parents and the siblings 
and the people who take care of that particular person, even at school. HPA1C maintenance is of primary importance, but we do tend to keep the HPA1C a little higher level for the simple reason being that when you have more chances of hypoglycemia, there could be cognitive impairment, and that is the last thing we want. So in children, especially preschoolers, prepubertal age group, or maybe even the pubertal age group, we do tend to maintain a HPA1C which is slightly on the higher side for this reason. Of course, parental and child burnout prevention, as I already mentioned. Prevention of metabolic deterioration is of essential importance as a goal of therapy. Tackling behavioral problems which does arise when a child goes from the phase of a school going age to more of the adolescent phase, you do tend to have more of a behavioral problems that has to be tackled with the help of a psychologist if it occurs. And sharing of positive experiences is very important as goals of therapy. Whenever a couple of people or meet at the doctor's office or when they come to a type 1 clinic which is in your hospital or your clinic, sharing the positive experiences does go a long way in maintaining the treatment of their type of diabetes. And what we have to remember is we have to chart realistic goals. A realistic goals is very important. There is no point in us to tell a patient who comes that you have to maintain a HbA1c so of less than 7 for a boy who say around 10 years of age. If we are going to just do, do it and treat only the numbers, then we will not be successful because the more stringent you are, the more chances of hypoglycemia and it will be there will be no compliance from the patient nor the relatives. Integration of diabetes meditators into the school, into the daily activities and at home is very important. All the people in these places should be briefed about the condition of the child and what should be done in case of acute chain of problems like hypoglycemia. Maintenance of normal growth and development as I already mentioned is one of the mainstays or main aims in the treatment of diabetes mellitus in children. Now I'm just talking about your HbA1c levels. So what are the HbA1c levels you would like to maintain in children? For example, let's take the toddlers of preschool, that is, let's say children who are less than six years of age. It would be all right or okay to mention, say, to maintain a HbA1c of something like seven to nine percent. A school going child from say 6 to 13 years, a prepubertal age group, well, a HbA1c of around less than 8% would suffice. And the child children who are pure or post pubertal or young adults or adolescent phase, it would be prudent if you can maintain a HbA1c of around less than 7.5%. So, less than 6 years, preferably 7 to 9%. 6 to 13 years, preferably around less than 8%. And more than 13, around 13 to 19 years, preferably less than 7.5 percent. So how does it, that in terms relate to sugars? We have toddlers. For example, let's take the fasting blood sugars, pre-meal sugars, and let's take the bedtime sugars. Approximately for a child who is less than six years of age, it would be all right if you could maintain your fasting sugars between 100 to 200, and your bedtime sugars something around 110 to 220. Similarly, in the age group of say 6 to 13 years, a fasting sugars maybe of 80 to 200 would be all right in that range. And a bedtime sugars or post dinner sugars maybe around 100 to 200, that also would suffice. In children who are more than 13 years of age, that is the adolescence phase, they are going through the adolescence phase. In those children, maybe a fasting sugars of say something around 80 to 170 and a post dinner sugars around 90 to 180 would suffice. So we should be aiming at approximately these levels and slowly as they progress in life we can make these controls more stringent because at that time they are even in a mental framework and they are mentally strong to understand clearly about the pathogenesis of their disease and to do accordingly for their own welfare. Now as far as the insulin therapy, because type 1 diabetes constitutes more than 90% of all the childhood diabetes, we would like to talk a little about insulin. But I won't go in great depth into that because our colleagues have already taken a separate module as far as the insulin therapy and the different modalities by which insulin is given to the patient. Now the DCCT controls in type 1 diabetes has clearly stated that 
if the patient has a very strict glycemic control and a very good maintenance of a HbA1c, the chances of later developing the microvascular complications is less. Therefore, that would be a primary aim to see that the child does not go in for any complication, thereby having more productivity in his or her life. And insulin therapy, remember, as always, has to be supervised. This is one thing which we'd like to tell you, that even if a child is around, say, 18 years of age, absolutely capable of taking insulin by himself or herself, it would be always prudent to have a watch over the child because, as I already mentioned in the earlier part of my talk, studies have shown that the compliance is better, the maintenance of HbA1c has been better when the child has been supervised. Types of insulin therapy, this is something which all of you would know. We are using a type 1, you can use basically the best one would be the basal bolus regimen, which is more or less near to the physiological limit, and it mimics the physiological limits. The other one would be a split mix, where you can give a combination of a regular and a intermediate acting insulin. Premixed insulin, well, in type 1 is not much used at all because it's very difficult to maintain a control. Continuous insulin infusion pump is another method by which insulin is given to the children of the adolescent, but it's a very cumbersome procedure and not many people are compliant with it, but it's a wonderful procedure because there's very chance, less chances of a patient going into a hyperglycemia once the patient is on a continuous insulin infusion. These other types of insulin which can be used are one, the regular insulin can be used, the analogs can be used, a long-acting insulin can be used, intermediate insulin can be used, and premixed type of insulin can also be tried out. So all the varieties of insulins are there, and depending on each person, and according to their requirement, we could taper the dose and the type of insulin. Now, when we come to the initiation of subcutaneous insulin in type 1 diabetes mellitus, now this has always been a very dicey area, and there has not been a specific algorithm to state that this is this, then this is this. But over a period of time, with a trial and error method, as far as the experience due to the experiences of our predecessors and the doyens in the field, we have a, some specific guidelines. And what do the guidelines say? A child who comes into the pre pubertal age group, if the child comes with no features of diabetic ketoacidosis or non-ketosis, the starting dose could be something like 0.25 units to 0.5 units per kg body weight. If a prepubertal child comes with features suggestive of ketosis, then the dose of starting insulin will be slightly on the higher side, something around, say, from 0.5 to 0.75 units per kg. Similarly, a child who is an adolescent or pubertal age group child who presents with no features of ketosis, a type 1 diabetic, can be started on insulin approximately from the range of 0.5 to 0.75 units per kg body weight. However, if that particular person, that is a pubertal age group person, presents with features of ketosis, then you could use an insulin of the dose starting from 0.75 to 1 unit per kg body weight. Now let's remember that these are only guidelines and these are highly flexible. As far as the insulin dosage goes, as we all know, two-thirds of the insulin is to be given in the morning and one-third the insulin is to be given in the night. When you are using a split mix regimen, that is a regular and a intermediate action in the morning and evening, one-third of this dose, that is for example, two-thirds of the dose I told is used in the morning. From this two-thirds, one-third of it should be short acting and the remaining should be intermediate acting. Similarly, one-third of the night dose, from the one-third of the night dose, one-third of it should be given as regular and the remaining as intermediate insulin. If the patient is going to be put on a basal bolus regimen, which is an excellent regimen for type 1 diabetes, well then what we can do is 60% of the total requirement can be given as pre-meal, that is pre-breakfast, pre-lunch and pre-dinner, and 40% can be given as intermediate insulin or the basal insulin. So a little on the insulin pump. I've already told you my colleagues have dwelt on it in detail, so I'll just tell you what are the advantages and disadvantages of an insulin pump. The advantage is that there's really good flexibility in wheel, and depending on the amount of food the person, he or she is going to take, the bolus insulin can be programmed. There is very decreased chances of hypoglycemia. It is excellent for intensive glucose controlling and to maintain a good HbA1c, thereby preventing the microvascular complications. 
and very few injections are required. But it also has its downside. One, it can cause a DKA if there's a malfunctioning, then a DKA can be precipitated. Skin abscesses are occasionally seen in people who have this pump. It has to be constantly worn, and therefore it is always an issue with parents who say that when the child is playing, what will happen if it gets dislodged? So these are some of the issues by which the parents do not want their children to be put on insulin infusion, common issues, increased frequency of blood monitoring, and most importantly, in our country, the expense is huge. So now we go on to the therapy in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Type 1, as you all know, is insulin and insulin and insulin. Type 2, so what do we aim for in a type 2 diabetes mellitus? Of course, we do aim for a good glycemic control. We do control the lipids and, of course, take care of the blood pressure if there is a high. We have to always aim for prevention of the acute and chronic complications. And the first agent to be used and approved by the FDA is, of course, metformin. And metformin also has an effect because it normalizes the anovulatory cycles of the patient, also has a PCOS. Add-on therapy should be brought into focus only if the metformin monotherapy fails. Now, metformin can be tried for a period of three to six months along with the diet and exercise, and only if that fails should an add-on therapy be added to the biogonide therapy. Now, coming to one of the most important facets in the treatment of diabetes mellitus, medical nutritional therapy. Now, drugs and drugs alone will not aid in the control of diabetes mellitus. It is like a tripod stand. Diet, exercise, and medications are essentially important. And even if one of the, tri one of the facets is going to miss, be missing or not to be adhered to strictly, there is going to be fluctuations in the glycemic control. Now, when we come to the medical uh, nutritional therapy, let's always remember one thing in mind. Every single dietary prescription has to be made for that particular individual. That is, it means it has to be individualized. Number two, it should contain the appropriate nutrients which is responsible or essential for the development of the child. Before we give a diet chart to the patient, the patient's normal dietary habits must be taken into consideration. The family's income, the family status, and the lifestyle of the family has to be taken into consideration before we embark upon prescription, prescribing a diet for a diabetic patient. Dietary consultation is a must with a trained dietitian. Why are we so much controlling of the diet? Because it helps to maintain a good, good blood glucose control, a lipid control, and of course, maintenance of good proper blood pressure. It prevents overall complications. It by itself acts as a medicine when taken properly and improves the growth factors and the other factors of skeletal development. So medical nutrition therapy is of utmost importance. So we should always remember, in a diabetic child, 70% of the calories should be from monosaturated fats and carbohydrates. Proteins, in a small child, for example, in infants, you could give even up to 2.2 grams per kg body weight of protein. But in adolescents, it's around 0.9 gram per kg body weight of protein should be substituted into the diet. The dietary cholesterol should always be maintained less than 300 milligram per day. Dietary fiber, a small note of the dietary fiber. A dietary fiber is, of course, as you know, a type of carbohydrate. It has a lot of plus points. It adds roughage. Basically, that it takes care of the constipation. And more importantly, it gives a feeling of satiety. And when the patient has a feeling of satiety, the patient does not have hunger, does not overeat, and weight maintenance is easier. So we come to something known as a calorie count. So the calorie count may differ, and again, this is just a mere guideline. So if a child is between a 0 to 12 years of age, he or she can be given 1,000 calories for the first year. There's 100 calories for every single next year. That is, if you are having a 2 years, add 100 calories. If it's 3 years, add another 100 calories, and so on. If the child is between 12 to 15 years, and if it's a girl child, you can have a diet of 1,500 to 2,000 calories and add 100 calories again for every year as it progresses. If it is a boy child between the age of 12 to 15 years, then we can have a diet of suppose from say some 2,000 to 2,500 calories 
and add 200 calories for every single year. In the age group of 15 to 20 years, for women, remember that you should have a calorie content of say 29 to 33 calories per kg body weight of ideal body weight and for a male say around 33 to 40 calories per kg of ideal body weight. So this is something about the calorific pattern. So based on this we can make an approximate calorific calculation and then decide how much of the nutrients has to be given for proper growth and development of a diabetic individual. Exercise. Another mainstay in the treatment of diabetes mellitus, let it be for type 1 or any kind of diabetes or even in diabetes of the older people. Exercise, why are we telling this child to do exercise? Number one, it improves the blood glucose levels. A one hour of exercise can have a very good bearing on the glycemic control and increases the insulin sensitivity maybe for 12 to 72 hours. Number two, decreases the insulin requirement decreases the risks of other health risks, weight maintenance is initiated and weight loss is maintained, and most importantly, can have a very good self-esteem, which goes a long way in taking care of all the other facets of diabetes management, and also is a good stress buster. So these are the, some of the reasons for which we initiate a diabetic patient on exercise. Now, when a person is going to exercise, or say a child is going to exercise, an adult is going to exercise, he or she is on an insulin therapy, or maybe a type 2 diabetic or a child who is on OHA therapy, there are a lot of precautions to be taken. We just cannot tell, yes, walk for one hour, walk for 45 minutes from day one. That is absolutely absurd. What should we do? One, we should give them a badge to wear, stating that this is a diabetic, this is the contact number of the person and this is what has to be done in case if the patient is found unconscious or has these particular symptoms. Number two, the patient should always be advised to carry to the site of exercise water, glucose and snacks. Number three, he has to check sugars especially before initiating an exercise regimen for the first time. He or she has to check the sugars prior to the exercise during the exercise and post-exercise. Point number four, he has to stick to a time schedule. Especially in a type 1 diabetic, what happens is, for example, let us say, the person is wants to do an exercise from 4 to 5. Over a period of time when he monitors his sugars, he will come to a basic analysis of himself that this is what his sugars is going to be. So when he knows this, he will be in a better position to do the exercise at the same time because when he does it at the same time, there's Rex chances of him going in for hypoglycemia. Another point is you should stick to the time schedule and note over exercise. If it is going to be half an hour, it should be half an hour. He or she should not overdo. Everything has its own limit. And remember not to exercise when your blood sugars are more than 300 or ketones are positive. If before the exercise you find out by glucometer readings that your sugar is only less than 100 or 100, Take a carbohydrate snack of 15 grams or 30 grams before you initiate yourself on an exercise regimen. And warm up and cool down phase is very essential. You have to have a warm up phase of at least five minutes and then an active exercise phase and then a cool down phase of five minutes before you stop the exercise regimen. Now insulin adjustment in exercise. When a person who is basically say on a split mix insulin is going for an exercise or maybe a person with a big dose regimen is going for exercise, there are certain things we have to tell him or her about the insulin dosage. For example, if the person is going to do a mild or moderate exercise, a mild or moderate exercise is one in which you have a heart rate which is less than 70% of your total heart rate. Your total heart rate can be calculated by 220 minus your age. That will give you a certain amount. Now 70% of that heart rate can be classified as severe exercise or heavy exercise rather, and anything less than 70%, they will say maybe 50% of that particular heart rate, can you can go take it as a mild to moderate exercise. Now in such situation, if the person is going to do a mild to moderate exercise, we can tell him or her that the short acting insulin has to be reduced by 20%. And the intermediate action insulin, maybe what he or she has taken in the morning, if she's going to do the exercise in the evening, should already be, have been reduced by 10%. Similarly, if the person is going to be initiated on a strenuous exercise regimen, then these conditions become more stringent. 
you should have a reduction of at least 30 to 50 percent in your short acting insulin and up to 20 to 35 percent reduction in your intermediate insulin action. So that is as far as the insulin therapy is concerned before you initiate them for an exercise. Now, coming to insulin dose adjustment and continuous insulin infusion, a person who's say on a continuous insulin infusion who's being initiated for exercise, we should tell him or her that at least 25 to 40% of the dose should be reduced, that is the basal rate, and we should monitor the sugars at least for the next four hours. And for the next four hours, let us continue on the same decreased dose of insulin. If by chance the sugars are coming down, if he or she feels that there's a hypoglycemia is coming, then you should take a carbohydrate snack needs to be added. Now coming to another serious and major aspect in the treatment of diabetes in the young is blood glucose monitoring. Now self blood glucose monitoring is of utmost importance because it helps to tell or tell us what the sugars are at any point of the day, fasting, post prandial, post lunch and post dinner. And by tightening this, we'll be able to maintain a good HbA1c and thereby in the long term prevent complications. So self-monitoring is of essential importance. Blood ketones can be checked and the necessary therapy initiated if ketones are positive. And the more important thing is what we'd like to do when we initiate any therapy is to prevent long term complications like neuropathy, retinopathy or nephropathy and monitor for associated conditions like blood pressure, hyperlipidemia over a period of time. So all these things has to be taken into consideration and proper monitoring has to be done. Another important issue which we come across in children is the sick day management. A child falls sick, the patient may be on a basal bolus regimen or a split mix regimen, could be a type 1 diabetic or could be a person with a type 2 diabetic, he's sick, refuses to take feeds. What are we supposed to do with the insulin? That is the question we have. Remember that one thing, never omit insulin. Never omit insulin. Do not stop insulin completely. Prevent the dehydration or take care of the hypoglycemia. Frequently we'll have to monitor sugars. As low as say two hours and four hours, we'll have to monitor sugars. We'll have to even monitor ketone once in four hours in such cases. Look out for always for ketosis and underlying infections. Treat the underlying conditions and always keep in touch with the healthcare professionals. For example, let's say if a child has a blood sugar of 80 to 250, well then in that case, it is all right if we don't give any insulin at a particular point of time. But if the same child is sick and has a glucose of say around 400 milligram, blood glucose of 400 milligram per deciliter, then we have to give some insulin. What happens in this condition is you have to take the total daily dose of insulin the child is taking and 10% of it has to be given if ketones are not positive. If ketones are going to be positive, give a dose which is 20% of the total daily dosage. Whatever said or done, even if we give this bolus dosage, every two to four hours, the sugars has to be checked and therapy initiated on and on until the person is able to sit up, take a normal diet, and thereby slowly switching on to him on to the ordinal regimen. Diabetes in school. School children face a lot of problems, especially type 1 diabetes. They find it difficult to take their insulin. They feel that uh, they are subjugated to some kind of uh, uh, treatment which we would not like to be meted out ourselves. These are common problems which we face, in which the child faces in school. And for this is the reason by which, or for which we say that the teachers, the school health nurse, and the friends of the child all have to be told about the child's condition so that they would be in a condition or a situation to help him if hypoglycemia results. So there should be involvement of the teachers, the parents, the child, the diabetes educator and the child's friends. It again should be an individualized planning for the child and he or she should be always asked to carry snacks along with the normal diet and emphasis on hypoglycemia especially to the teachers and his friends should be stressed upon. Glucagon administration should be taught to the people in the school and ketone assessment can also be done in school. If they are taught and proper, uh, proper uh, guidelines are given to them and taught how they should basically monitor the ketone, how it should be tested, they themselves can do it in the school. So in short, what we have over here is childhood and adolescent diabetes care is a combined effort from a lot of people 
the family, the patient, the doctor, the nurse educator, the physiotherapist, the psychologist, the social worker, and also, of course, the dietitian. Each and every one of them have to play a major role so that we have a comprehensive diabetic care for a particular person and enable him or her to live a balanced life. So this is just only a gist or a tip of an iceberg or just an idea of basically what has to be done in children with diabetes mellitus in childhood and adolescent period. Now we go back to the slides we came into the first three case scenarios. We'll go back to the first three case scenarios and we'd like to go through it. So the first case scenario, as I told you, was a, Mr. X, a 16-year-old with acute symptoms of weight loss, polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia. He has urine ketones positive, ACPC is elevated, a BMI is low, and no family history of uh, diabetes mellitus, no markers of insulin resistance, no markers of insulin resistance most probably rules out the type 2 diabetes mellitus, and moreover, his BMI is also in the normal range, or really the low normal range. There's no history suggesting abdominal pain, there's no steatoria, so most probably there's chances of pancreatic diabetes is also less. So most probably your diagnosis will be a type 1 diabetes mellitus. Case 2, executive son, 19 years of age, goes in for a dental extraction, found to have high sugars, HPA1C of 8, ACPC is elevated, a good strong family history of diabetes mellitus, acanthosis nigric acid is present. That's a marker of insulin resistance. So your diagnosis is a type 2 diabetes mellitus in childhood. Now we have case 3. A, a person who is a 20 year old male for a routine evaluation because generations in family have diabetes mellitus. At least three generations of family have diabetes mellitus. He has a normal BMI. Does not have markers of insulin resistance, so most probably it is not a type 2 diabetes mellitus. He does not have any pancreatic symptoms. He has an AC of 147, PC of 231, and considering his age factors and everything, most probable diagnosis is it's a type of Modi. So in all these three things, we have three different case scenarios. A type 1, where the initial insulin should be initiated. A type 2, where we can initiate the person on a metformin therapy. And now case 3, a probable diagnosis of maturity onset of diabetes mellitus. Well, if you could do the genetic testing and find out, well, it would be very good. But this looks like more, not like a type a Modi type 2, because Modi type 2 usually has only a fasting hyperglycemia. So this is a person who could be treated with sulfonylureas because sulfonylureas are the drug of choice for a patient with Modi. So that's in short about the childhood diabetes and adolescent diabetes. And I hope that you have got at least a basic understanding or a basic idea of what it is so that we could be able to give a proper therapy to our patients thereby enabling them to live a very balanced life. Thank you.